In this short video, we're going to study a specific type of differential equation. And the advantage of this differential equation is that we can use information from the differential equation to get a rough sketch of the solution curve without actually knowing the solution. These differential equations are called autonomous differential equations. We'll restrict our study to first order autonomous differential equations. And in any autonomous differential equation, the independent variable does not appear explicitly. So what that means is that if x is your independent variable, you will not see x anywhere alone uh, by in, its, in the equation. Uh, and if t is the independent variable, you won't see t. So the normal form is dy dx equals some function of y. Be careful, f here does not represent a solution. It represents the right-hand side of the normal form. <clears throat> so for example, the differential equation dy dx equals y squared minus 4y. That's an autonomous uh, differential equation. The x does not appear anywhere. Uh, however, here, this differential equation, which we've looked at previously, dy by dx equals 0.2xy, that's not autonomous because we have the x appearing in the right-hand side. And all of the differential equations that we explored for the applications are all autonomous. So for our population growth, uh, we don't see t anywhere. We only see p, which is the dependent variable. Same thing for exponential decay. And for Newton's law of cooling, uppercase t is the dependent variable. And we don't see lowercase t appearing in the equation. Now, for autonomous DEs, we have the notion of a critical point. And the critical point are the any zeros of the right-hand side. Remember, a zero of f of y would be a number c, where f of c equals zero. And so if that number c makes the right-hand side zero, that would mean that dy dx equals zero. That would agree with our notion from calculus one for a critical point. Now, there's many names that are used for this number c if f of c equals zero. It may be called a critical point, a critical value, a critical number, an equilibrium point, or a stationary point. And those last two phrases should make a little bit more sense by the end of the video. Uh, here's a fact that's easy to verify that if you y equals c is a critical point of this first order autonomous DE, then y of x equals c is a constant solution of the differential equation. If you think about that, if it makes the right hand side zero, uh, then that means if dy dx equals zero, then y must be a constant. Right? And it must be a constant that makes the right-hand side zero, and that must mean it's one of the critical points. Uh, these constant solutions are also called equilibrium solutions. So the number c can be called an equilibrium point, and uh, the solution y equals c is referred to as an equilibrium solution. So here's a special type of autonomous uh, differential equation. The right hand side is a quadratic in p. So p is our independent variable. Uh, it's already in factored form for us. a and b are two constants which are positive. And so the critical points, the values of p, which make this right-hand side 0, are either p equals 0 or p equals a over b. 
Now, if we're trying to uh, understand the solution curve for P, we might want to look at where, you know, P, uh, the right-hand side is positive or negative. That'll tell us about dP, dt, if it's increasing or decreasing. And so in Calc 1, we would draw a horizontal number line, put our critical numbers, and then we would write down the sign of dp dt, which is the same as the sign of f of p. And, uh, but now since p is actually the dependent variable, it would make more sense to create a vertical line. And instead of using the pluses and the minus, we're going to use an arrow. So the downward pointing arrow says that for p values, which are greater than a over b, then the dp dt, this, or this right hand side, is negative or decreasing. That means p is decreasing. And then between 0 and a, and a over b, it is increasing, and below zero, it's decreasing. So this diagram is uh, sometimes called a 1D phase portrait, or just a phase portrait. And the vertical line itself is called a phase line. So we know something about the solution here. Uh, this function P of T we know on which intervals it's increasing and on which intervals it's decreasing. So let's see what other information we can get from these critical points. We're interested, again, in trying to find the solution curve. So let's look at a general autonomous first order differential equation. We're going to assume that it has two critical points. That's y equals c1 and y equals c2. And we're going to have an initial condition where y of x naught equals y naught. The critical points then will divide the xy plane into three regions. We're going to have these constant solutions, y equals c1 and y equals c2. So the region above the larger constant solution, we're going to call R3. The region between the two constant solutions is going to be R2, and the region below the smaller constant solution, we're going to call R1. Now, this is an important idea, so let's read through it carefully. If our initial condition point x naught comma y naught is in a given region, and let's just say it's in R2, then any solution curve passing through that initial point must stay in R2. And let's think of why that's true. Well, it has something to do with the fact that these horizontal lines are solutions to the differential equation. And so if a curve were ever to get onto a line, it could never leave the line, right? It would, uh, once you have a, an x value where the y value is one of the critical points, then for all other x values, it must also have that same y value. And so if you've started somewhere else, you can never get onto the line. If you, the only way you can be on the line is if you're always on the line. So our solution curves cannot jump the critical point lines. And again, it has to do with the fact that those two uh, equations, y equals c1 and y equals c2, are solutions, constant solutions, or equilibrium solutions for the differential equation. So now we're starting to get a hint as to why they're called equilibrium solutions. 
That is, if you start on that line, you will never get off of it. You will always stay in equilibrium. The uh, p value, or the, I'm sorry, the y value here is never going to increase or decrease if you start on one of those equilibrium solutions. All right, so what else? Uh, since y, I'm sorry, since the function f, remember f is the right-hand side, not the solution, is going to be continuous, uh, then f is always positive or f is always negative. That comes from the intermediate value theorem. Remember that uh, the only places that we have zeros are at the critical points. And so off the critical points, it's always going to be it's either going to be positive or negative. And the only way that F could go from positive to negative is to cross over one of these critical point lines. And so um, if F starts in, in R2 throughout the whole region of R2, it's going to have the same sign. If it starts in, in a different region, it'll always have the same sign there. And again, that has to do with the right hand side, but the right hand side tells us the slope of our solution. And so we know that in each one of the regions, since the slope is either always positive or always negative, the solution function y will always be increasing or will always be decreasing in each region. And when you're always increasing or always decreasing, we had a special word remember that from calculus one, it's called monotonic. So it cannot oscillate. It either starts increasing and continues to increase and or it starts decreasing and continues to decrease for all values of x. All right, so what else can we discern from that? Well, if you're always increasing but you can't cross these lines, then these lines must be horizontal asymptotes for the solution curves. So if uh, the solution is bounded above by a particular line, then it must get arbitrarily close to that line, either as x goes to infinity or x goes to negative infinity. It's just a horizontal asymptote. And if you recall uh, from calculus one, a horizontal asymptote is a line that satisfies either of these conditions. So we'd have to use some more information to determine uh, uh, which one of these conditions hold. And the same idea if it's bounded below, and uh, it must be a, uh, a horizontal asymptote. So we know that if we have a solution curve, if it starts in one region, uh, it can never leave the region, and it's either going to be always increasing or always decreasing. And based on that information, we can see that uh, any line above it or below it would be a horizontal asymptote. So let's go back to our special uh, autonomous differential equation. And we had our two critical numbers or critical points, p equals a over b and p equals zero. So we've got our three regions, the region above p equals a over b, the region between p equals zero and p equals a over b, and the region below p equals zero. Here we're looking in the p t plane. So p is our independent variable, I mean, dependent variable. t is independent variable. And so again, we're going to expect to see our solution curves to have horizontal asymptotes p equals a over b and or p equals zero. So let's go back to our phase line here. Um, remember that above a over b, p is decreasing. Also below zero, p is decreasing. But between 
zero and a over b, p is increasing. So now if I have an initial condition in uh, region one, so below uh, p equals zero, I know that in that region, I'm always decreasing. So that should give me enough information to make a very rough sketch. So since I'm always decreasing, that means as I go to the left, I must be getting closer and closer to uh, the P equals zero horizontal asymptote. Now, mind you, this is a very rough sketch, but certainly it gives us some important information about the behavior of the solution. Now, on the other hand, if I have my initial point or the point from the initial condition uh, in region two, remember from our phase diagram in region two, we were always increasing. So I'm going to increase through it. So as, I, as T goes to positive infinity, I'm going to get close to the upper line. And as T goes to negative infinity, I should get close to the lower line. So I'll have a curve that looks something like this, but maybe a little bit more smoother. Uh, it's kind of difficult to draw these curves by hand. And finally, if my initial condition uh, is above the line P equals A over B, I'm in region three and um, there I'm always decreasing again. So I expect my curve to come down as, I'm, as t gets larger and as t goes to infinity, the curve should approach the line p equals a over b. So something like that. All right, let's look at another example. Here I have dy by dx equals y minus two in parentheses squared. And I am given an initial condition, which somehow is hidden here. There we go. And we have y of 0 equals y naught. Now, there's only one critical point. That's y equals 2. So I have this equilibrium solution, y equals 2. It divides the xy plane into two regions. But what's interesting, because I have this squared here, that it doesn't really matter whether I'm below it or above two. So below two or above two, dy dx is always going to be positive, which means that the solution function, y of x is always increasing. So if y naught is greater than two, I'll have a point um, above the line and I'll be increasing. If, uh, and if, uh, so the curve should go something like this. On the other hand, if my initial condition is below two, then again, I'm always increasing. So I'd have to, as I go from right to left, come up to the line y equals two. So those would be my potential solution curves right there. So the last concept we want to explore is the notion of attractors and repellers. So if I have a non-constant solution to an autonomous DE and I have a critical point, as you move from left to right, if all of the direction arrows, so we're going back to direction fields, uh, if they point towards Y equals C, then C is an attractor and we consider asymptotically stable. Remember that the constant solution is an equilibrium solution. It's a, it's a stable solution. And so we're getting closer and closer to that stable solution as time increases going from left to right. Uh, so on the other hand, if they point away from y equals c, then c is a repeller or is unstable. And if it's neither an attractor or a repeller, it's called semi-stable. So if I look at uh, 
the autonomous differential equation dy by dx equals sine of y. And here I've plotted the direction fields using some technology from GeoGebra. Uh, you can see that we have between, on my plot, I only went from negative 5 to 5. So between negative and 5 and 5, there are three critical points. The first one at negative pi, another one at 0, and a one at pi. So these are my equilibrium lines, equilibrium solutions. And you can see, as I go from left to right, for pi, and also for negative pi, all of the direction, these little lineal elements, are pointing towards that equilibrium line. However, looking at 0, as I move from left to right, that's important, all of the lineal elements are going away from it. So that's going to be a repeller. We don't see a semi-stable solution here, but we could also reference the uh, solution curves here. Uh, if I go back and look at our solution curves for this autonomous differential equation, as I go from left to right, Above y equals 2, I'm going away from the line, but below it, I'm getting close to it. So that would be a semi-stable uh, critical number. And if I go back again here to the uh, three solution curves for uh, this differential equation. That one uh, in region three was getting close to p equals a over b. The one in region two also gets close to p equals a over b as you go from right to left. So this critical number would be an attractor. Uh, however, uh, p equals zero is going to be a repeller because as we go from left to right, Sorry, the solution curves move away from p equals zero. So we can use these, uh, this information to help us sketch the solution curve. Now there's one other property of autonomous differential equations. Uh, and it's called the translational property. Now, if you look on any horizontal line here, you're going to see that all the lineal elements have the same slope. And what that means is that you can take a horizontal shift of a solution curve. And if you shift it horizontally, you're going to get another solution curve, which says that if you have a solution, y of x, remember the way you do a horizontal shift algebraically is that you uh, subtract a number from the input variable. This would be a shift to the right of value k. So take any number k, put it as the x minus k as the input, you'll get a new solution. And in fact, if you have an initial value problem and you know the solution, and uh, then you make a shift, you'll get a solution to a, a, an another initial value problem where the initial point has been shifted as well. So we can see that using uh, direction fields, we can get an idea of the shape of the solution curve. But if we also have an autonomous differential equation, we can get even more information about the solution curve without actually solving it.